from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome all of you to the Kluge Center. Many of you are Kluge scholars, so you don't have to be welcome to the Kluge Center. You're already at the Kluge Center. Um, but this is for um, the Kislak Fellowship annual lecture. Um, this year's fellow was Frauke Saxa. Um, she is the professor of Mesoamerican Studies at the University of Bonn. Um, but she's a lot more than that. The description professor of Mesoamerican studies doesn't really um, go far enough. Um, Frauke, at least in my estimation, is one of the premier linguists working in the world right now on a small group of languages, um, many of them that are endangered. Her dissertation focused on a particular language called Sinka. Um, it is an extremely endangered language that only a few people in the world have worked on. Um, Frauke used 18th century grammars in order to reconstruct what that language looked like, how it was spoken. She spent many years in the field doing field work um, to mixed success, being there were few speakers who actually could speak the language. Um, since her dissertation, she's continued work on that, but she has also focused on other um, Mesoamerican languages. Um, the area that we are talking about, which is this small area in Central America, is one of the most linguistically dense in the world. Um, just in the Mayan languages are owned uh, alone, depending on who you, who you talk to, there are anywhere from 30 to 36 languages that are currently spoken. Um, she's going to speak to us today about her Kislak project, um, which she is also working on with another researcher whose name is Gary Sparks, who's also in the audience. Um, about a manuscript that is pretty much totally unknown in the Mesoamerican studies world. Um, and Frauke and Gary have made extreme inroads into discovering what may turn out to be one of the most important manuscripts in the Kislak collection. Um, so without further ado, Frauke. Thank you very much, John, for this uh, very kind, far too kind introduction. I hardly recognize myself. <laughs> um, I would like to start this with a couple of thanks. Uh, thanks first to the Kluge Center, the Kislak Foundation, for uh, awarding me with this fellowship. Um, I would like to thank my recommenders, Nancy Ferris, uh, Alan Christensen, and Laura Trexler for helping me get this fellowship. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank the staff of the Kluge Center, in particular Mary Lou Rieke and Travis Hensley, who have been tremendously helpful and um, full of support and assistance. I would like to thank you, John, for your great support and assistance during, during this research um, and the entire staff of the Geography and Maps Department. Um, as you already said, the project is not my own project. It's a project that I'm doing together with Gary Sparks from George Mason University. So all the work and all the results I'm going to talk about today are uh, collaborative. This is not only my achievement, this is our joint achievement. Um, so I'm, we are working um, on this manuscript uh, in the Kislak collection for which I received um, this, this wonderful fellowship and Gary has been able to do this re research based on NEH funding. Uh, so we are both tremendously grateful for the support. Um, the plans, well, we have plans for various publications which are coming out of this research that we're currently doing and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this today. Um, for once, we hope that we can produce an edition of the entire document that is in the Library of Congress. Um, a proposal for this is currently under revision here at the Publications Department and of course we are very, very hopeful that this is going to be um, seen uh, as an interesting project and maybe get some support. So what are we talking about here? Why is this not working? Can somebody help me? It's not working. That one? Ah, good. So, we are talking about a 16th century um, manuscript. It's a handbook um, that was used by a missionary. 
in Highland Guatemala. Um, these kinds of handbooks were called Vademecums, Go With Me, little, like what we today have as a moleskin handbook, a little handbook that contained various doctrinal texts and other documents and textual materials that were relevant uh, to this um, particular missionary for his missionary efforts. And it's particularly interesting because it contains uh, a collection of different texts in different Mayan languages from Highland Guatemala. I would like to give you a little bit of background information. Um, Highland Guatemala is or was the second region or the second major region that was conquered by the Spanish on the American continent in 1524. The Quiche speaking kingdom of Utatlan was the main power in this ethnically and linguistically very diverse um, Maya Highland region. And as uh, John has pointed out um, already, there are many different Mayan languages that are still spoken today. And just in Guatemala, in this region, we have 21 Mayan languages that are spoken to this very day. So one third of the Guatemalan population today speaks a Mayan language, something that is not very well known. From the beginning, um, Christianization, the mission, the conversion to the Christian faith um, took place in the indigenous languages. And a particular role um, was played by Bartolomé de las Casas, the so-called defender of the Indians, who ended the bloodshed of the conquest, which was particularly violent in Highland Guatemala, by replacing the sword with the gospel and successfully pacifying the resisting province of Tesulutlan by means of preaching to the indigenous population in their own language. Guatemala is therefore one of the best areas to study the encounter between pre-Columbian and European religions and uh, world systems because there was so much um, missionary documentation and so much material that was produced by these missionaries in these indigenous languages. And um, mostly, the, for the most part, this material has been uh, neglected by researchers and there's now a, a small group of, of, of people, more and more researchers, linguists, theologians, uh, historians, becoming more and more interested in doing work with these um, missionary text documents in indigenous languages. And the Kislak manuscript um, 1015 is one of the earliest specimens of such missionary or doctrinal text documents. It is, as I already said, a compilation of various texts in different Highland Mayan languages. And all of these texts in this manuscript are copies of even earlier originals that were copied or compiled and then newly bound uh, for the purpose of this particular missionary. Some pages were also deleted by the binding, uh, after, the, after the new binding and we can also see that some pages were cut out by whoever was using that document. We see here a, a picture of a cut out page. Um, but we cannot really say very much about the binding and uh, the paper yet, other than that we know it's all 16th century uh, because the analysis of the paper and the watermarks marks is something that is currently being undertaken by the Conservation Division of the Library of Congress, and we are looking forward uh, to getting these results. So the, the document or the manuscript consists of uh, various texts by different scribes and copyists. Um, we can define different hands. You can see them here numbered from A to F. Um, the compilation of the texts is rather eclectic, one must say. Um, they, they are of very diverse origin and of particular interest for us as Mesoamericanists um, are various sections um, of Mayan uh, numerals um, or numbers, lists of numbers. There are also sections of Latin numerals. Um, there are prayers in Latin, as well as um, uh, catechisms in Quiche and in Kakchikel. And the core texts um, include several sections um, done by the same copyist or by the same hand, which is uh, hand number F. 
um, which include um, the text Cosas de la Fe Católica, or in English, Things of the Catholic Faith, uh, a text um, labeled Kochom, which is Quiche for music, and another section which is called Sermones or Sermons. Um, there are further texts uh, that are also done by that same copyist, um, which is uh, texts for the rep prerequisites of marriage, a list of contents of the preceding three texts in the core te section, and further marriage prescriptions and taboos. I will come to that later, that's because that section is particularly interesting. So what have we done so far with this manuscript? Um, in the fall, we produced a full transcription of the entire um, book, which now amounts to, uh, the, the entire book itself uh, has 100 uh, folios um, written on both sides, and uh, in the transcription that amounts to 150 pages, Times New Roman, 10 point single space. Uh, so it's a lot of text um, that we are going to. It's all in, in, in these uh, indigenous Mayan languages. So we have a lot of translation work ahead of us. We are now working on the textual analysis of these sections and uh, are in the process of preparing several publications. Um, besides the manuscript edition that we would like to do, um, we are planning a detailed translation of this core section on the Cosas de la Fe Católica, which I will talk about in more detail today. And uh, we are working on an article about the number section and the marriage uh, rules, which are also um, topics that I will be talking about. Let's um, look at dating the volume. How old is this really? Um, it's a bit tricky. The document, I mean, the handbook itself is clearly 16th century, the handwriting is 16th century, the binding is 16th century. So far, that's clear. There are two references in the handbook to a compilation date um, of 1567. The core section um, includes um, the core section of this um, songs that we, I will be talking about, um, ends in a colophon. And, um, the text preceding this colophon indicates that the copyist or scribe completed the copy on the 23rd of July in 1567 in the Valle de Panchoy, which is um, today's Antigua, Guatemala. And this particular date of uh, 1567 is repeated uh, further below in this, um, in this colophon. The colophon itself references the date 1555, which may be a reference to the date of the original from which the scribe copied. Um, and a bit more enigmatic is the reference to 1544, the fathers arrived, and 1552, the book was completed. We are not quite sure what these um, references uh, really refer to. We are also not quite sure whether we're reading it correctly because these texts are um, spelled with um, abbreviations. Um, so we're still studying this uh, section and um, don't really know whether these um, earlier dates might actually refer to an original um, uh, compilation date. So let's look at these uh, various uh, sections of uh, the handbook. I talked about these Mayan numbers. Um, what's really special about uh, the, um, the Kislak manuscript is that it has a unique list of written Mayan numbers, which goes from one to 70 million. And um, although we have sections on Mayan numbers in other dictionaries and grammars on Highland Mayan languages, none of these go that high. Uh, we've never seen something going up that high. We could identify the language um, these numbers are written in as Ishil. This is also very remarkable because there's no other document um, to our knowledge um, from the colonial era that is written in, in Ishil. So this may be the only document um, in Ishil language, certainly from the 16th century, if not in general. The analysis of the number section is uh, really interesting as it provides us with a very detailed example of how counting works not only in Ishil, but also in other Highland Mayan languages. And um, this, is, this is also of general interest for Mesoamerican studies um, because uh, we do understand 
the number system, the arithmetics of, um, of Mesoamerica quite well. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, research has been done in particular on classic Maya culture. We have here a picture of um, one page of the uh, Codex uh, Dresden, one of the four surviving Mayan books from uh, the um, pre-Columbian time, which is written in Maya hieroglyphic writing and uh, full of uh, calendrical information, um, and, uh, and then astronomical information. And we know since the very, since the 19th century, researchers like uh, Ernst Förstermann, and then in the 20th century in particular, Sir Eric Thompson and also Floyd Lounsbury have um, produced tremendous um, um, detailed information and analysis on how calendrics and mathematics uh, work in the classic Maya system. So we do understand uh, that quite well, and I will give you a, a slight, uh, a short introduction into this. Mayan counting is based on a vigesimal system. Um, vigesimal is based on the number 20. So our, our decimal system that we are used to, as we all know, uh, based, is based on the number 10. So um, you, you count in, in different, um, steps of, um, that are all um, multiplied by 10. So 1 times um, 10 is 10, times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000. And these different cycles are labeled with, with names, like a decade, uh, a century, uh, a millennium. And we uh, notate this in place notation. So uh, when you see the number 1,983, this means it's three times one, it's eight times 10, it's nine times 100, and one times um, 1,000. And in the vigesimal system, that works basically the same way, it's just the basis is 20. So um, you start with one and you take that times 20 is 20, times 20 is 400, times 20 is 8,000, times 20 is 160,000, times 20 is 3,200,000. And each of these cycles in uh, Mayan languages has uh, their own name, like we have decades, uh, centuries, and millennia. Um, and these uh, names for these uh, cycles we do find uh, in this uh, Ishil document. So we have special terms uh, for the numbers uh, 20, which is Winak, for the numbers 80, which is, which is Muchul, for the numbers 400, Much, which, which, uh, excuse me, um, Okop, which is really interesting here because um, the form itself um, only occurs with higher numbers. So we do uh, find in the text um, here under uh, 800, I'm, I don't have a pointer, do I? No? Okay. Oh, I do. Okay. Um, does that show? Okay. So, uh, 800 is, is basically written as 2 times 400. 400 itself doesn't occur as 1 times 400. It just occurs as 4 times uh, 80. So, it's a very um, intricate um, um, counting system here. We also have uh, terms for the... Um, the cycles of 8,000, Shuyul, 160,000, Kalab, and uh, 3,200,000, Tiche. The Kislak manuscript is very special in giving uh, examples for very complex high numbers, as you can see on this manuscript page. For example, we have numbers like 369,000, 381,000. When we were looking at this at first, we had doubts whether this was really a true Mayan number system or whether this may have been a, scribe, a, a, a missionary trying to translate um, um, European numbers into, into uh, Ishil. But we have analyzed it and we uh, find um, that it is indeed a full Maya vigesimal uh, counting system which uh, functions the same way as the classic Maya system does. 
So as an example, the number 357,000 is written out, out as Ochukul Toshla Okrop Tochui Tosh Kalab, and that translates into four times, uh, f five times 40 into the cycle of 13 times 400 into the cycle of five times 8,000 into the cycle of three times 160,000, which is the same as 200 plus 4,800 plus 32,000 plus 320,000, which amounts to 357,000. It is a, a bit complicated and students of Maya studies or Mesoamerican studies take an entire semester to, to get through this. Uh, so um, I apologize for, for, for this being a bit tedious um, in this talk, but just to give you an idea what we are dealing with here, this, that we have to be a bit mathematical. <laughs> and um, we are currently wrapping up the results of our analysis uh, into an article and hope that we get this uh, written and published uh, very, very soon. The next section is a bit more <laughs> easy to grasp. Um, Gary and I are also working on this uh, at high speed at the moment. Um, it's um, the section that regards marriage prescription rules. Very interesting, you have several pages at the end of the manuscript which have these um, these drawings of these circles with names in them and explanations. And we first thought that these were genealogies because the form of representation corresponds with what you find in Renaissance Spain or also up until the 19th century in Spain um, as family trees. Yeah? This is the way how, how these things are presented. However, when we, are tr when we were translating the associated Quiche texts, uh, it was revealed that we are not dealing with genealogies, but with hypothetical or exemplary drafts of kinship relations and accompanying explanations of what in Christian uh, or Spanish thought would be understood as an illegitimate uh, or a legitimate sexual relation or marriage taboos and their respective impact on legal inheritance. To give you an example, um, this is basically a, a, a more um, easier visualized um, uh, illustration of what we find in the original manuscript. So let me let me translate that for you. If um, Pedro has some illegitimate um, relation with Maria which means it's, re it's spelled here in Quiche as the Raj Ahmak, he is the companion of the sinner, but more, she is the companion of the sinner, so he's a sinner that implicates that. This is an illegitimate uh, sexual relationship. If that is the case, then Pedro must not marry either Maria's daughter or her mother or her grandmother, which is to European eyes, uh, ears, uh, first a uh, bit bizarre. Why would somebody want to marry the grandmother of a concubine? Um, it also says that Maria must not marry Pedro's son. So that's also forbidden. Pedro's son, however, may marry Maria's daughter or her granddaughter. So what we are thinking we're dealing with here is that um, these were drafts that were used to teach uh, the local population about um, understandings of legitimate marriage and inheritance rules um, in Christian European society, which is, uh, the, the, was the new cultural system that was implemented by the conquistadors um, and the missionaries. Um, it may also reveal, the section may also reveal uh, indirect clues as to what was cultural practice in Highland Guatemala because obviously the missionaries saw a certain need in uh, making people understand that they couldn't marry their mother or their grandmother, which 
at first appears uh, bizarre, but it may not be that bizarre at all because uh, very often marriage doesn't have anything to do with sexual relations, but with um, making sure that somebody survives and uh, um, maintaining and feeding somebody. So um, in, in other cultures, these, um, uh, these, uh, the concept of marriage has, has different um, implications. So, um, so we are working. We are working on that, and we are also um, drafting um, an article uh, on 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 this. So you see, there's a lot of research that comes out of this particular document. But now, finally, to the text that is really the focus of this talk, and which is the oldest part um, of the compilation of the Vademecum, which dates to at least 1555. And this text includes songs um, or hymns and is the reason why I gave this talk the, the title um, that, I, that I chose, uh, Songs of Faith and Devotion, because it's really about these uh, songs. They make a big section of uh, the manuscript. So let's look at this. The Spanish heading in the original text uh, reads, beginning of the succession of things regarding the Catholic faith from the beginning to the end in form of hymns or psalm, psalms or songs so that the Indians would sing them in their festivals or holidays. Um, the following uh, paragraph in Quiche specifies that the text um, is a Chanalipal book, that is a cantation book, and a Bishapal book book or a song book, which serves the purpose of narrating the word of God in form of songs that shall be sung at the annual Christian holidays. If we look at the context, uh, contents of these texts, um, the text spans from um, folio 17 recto to 59 recto, so that's more than 40 folios with very tiny writing, as you can see here. It comprises a total of 50 chapters and uh, an additional 12 hymns. Um, and Gary was suggesting that that may be related, uh, these 50 chapters might be related to the weeks of the year, that it is certain uh, songs that are sung in, in each uh, week of the year. Um, though we are still working on establishing that that is really the case. Um, each um, section has a title, or each, each chapter has a title or a heading, which is in Spanish, but the texts and the songs are in Quiche. Um, the chapters are of variable length, so some are just, um, just, just, just half a page, and others are several pages long. They're divided into stanzas, which you can see here in the image. Um, which are marked by a colonial style Pilko sign, yeah, which divides the different stanzas. And to give you an example for these stanzas, um, we have now put them into a more rhythmic pattern. I read the first one um, in English. Um, the truth I shall remember and the faithfulness I shall tell. And then literally, much evil I feel for the fabricated word, which is very metaphorical and in Kiché means as much as I despise the lie. There are no indications that these uh, stanzas are following any kind of old world model of rhyme or metric system. However, when you look at the next stanza, oh much I despise what was lost, uh, that was lost the truth of being, uh, great is my tremble, my lament, because was lost, it was lost the truth of being. You can see um, that, you can see in this repetition here, the great is my tremble, my lament, nim musik, nim vocal, um, that the author uh, follows Maya poetics by using couplets or parallelisms, and in this case, um, this particular phrase, which, uh, which is something that we know from indigenous uh, language documents by Mayan authors um, and um, is a pattern which is very well known from uh, the um, Theologia Endorum by Domingo de Vico about 
which I will say something in a, in a few seconds. If we look at the contents of the chapters with their many stanzas, we find detailed treaties of biblical narratives, including Genesis, the fall of man, the banishment from paradise, uh, the division of a language at Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Moses, saint stories, and of course the life of Jesus from his birth to the passion, including all the miracles, and it's very detailed. Based on the terminology that is used in the text, we can attribute authorship clearly to the Dominican order or the, or the order of preachers. Um, as I have shown, um, doctrinal texts um, produced by Dominicans in Highland Guatemala systematically adopt terminology from um, Highland Maya um, ritual language, while Franciscan and other authors prefer to introduce loan words from Latin and create neologisms or new terms. Um, there are certain key terms um, that are indicative for 16th century Dominican doctrinal literature in Guatemala, and these terms have to date been primarily associated with Domingo de Vico's Theologia in Dorum. And this is where I have to uh, mention another project that is um, going on at the moment and is parallel to the work that Gary and I are doing uh, here on the Kislak manuscript which is a project that is um, led by Gary Sparks, um, who actually is the utmost authority on the Theologia in Dorum and Domingo de Vico um, in the world, I would say. Um, it's, uh, it's a project which is uh, head, uh, headed by him, led by him on the translation of this particular document, and I'm happy to be part of this uh, project. The Theologia Andorum was the first theology of the Americas that was entirely written in Quiche. Uh, it comprises two volumes of 700 folios. It's a very um, abundant source and summarizes um, all basics of the Christian faith uh, written for a Quiche speaking audience. And this Domingo de Vico incorporated a lot of terminology and concepts from pre Columbian religion to make the Christian concepts understood to the Quiche speakers. And some of these terms um, that we find in the Theologia and Dorum and that have been identified in, uh, in Gary's um, research, we now also find um, in the Kislak manuscript, which makes this um, Kislak source um, very, very interesting for us because we think it is earlier than the Theologia and Dorum and that changes um, the picture a little bit. Um, so terms that are referenced, for example, are that the Christian God is referred to as Tzakol Bitol, the framer and the former, which is a reference to um, a Mayan creator God um, that also occurs in indigenous documents. And he's referred to as Dios Nim Achau, the great Lord, which is a term that according to the Apologetica Historia by Bert Bartolomé de las Casas was used before the arrival of the Spanish to refer to the most powerful creator deity. Um, it's, what is particularly fascinating is something that Gary pointed out in his research that um, the Christian God is referred to uh, as our mother and our father, which is a very Mayan concept. Uh, a Christian, in, we all know in Christianity, God is male, yeah? God is not female. But in Maya thought, it is both. Yeah? It is female and male, and the female is always referenced first. Um, another concept which, uh, which, which I have done some work on is um, uh, the concept of Kanal Rashal, the abundance, um, the green, uh, the yellowness and the greenness, which refers to abundance from a rich maize harvest and is a topic that, uh, or a concept that is used um, in, um, uh, in Maya, uh, Maya religion, Maya ritual um, uh, terminology. And it is here reused uh, in order to refer to the glory of the Christian God. So there are several um, indications here that we are dealing with a Dominican source because these are uh, terms that are uh, indicative of Dominican translation practices. With respect to the Dominican origin of the text, it is also interesting to note um, 
that um, the scribe uses a very unconventional and not otherwise used orthographic um, forms uh, and, and letters to represent the sounds of the Quiche phonemic system that are not part of the Spanish or the Latin alphabet. He does um, not follow conventions that are used by other missionaries um, and that have been um, established by the Franciscan Francisco de la Parra, which you see in the uh, box down here below. Uh, Francisco de la Parra defined uh, that the glottalized K uh, would be represented by uh, the sign four and the, the uvula K by what we call a K and the glottalized uvula K by this um, turned around three or the tresillo. And our scribe here uses completely different conventions to, to represent these sounds, which we um, interpret um, a little bit as maybe that Dominicans were authoring these texts and were competing with the Franciscan missionaries because this is really in the very early stages of uh, when these uh, conventions were defined and that they said, we are not going to follow Franciscan conventions. We are doing our own uh, orthographic style. So this is, from that point of view, palographically a very interesting source as well. The strongest connection to Dominican authorship, however, comes from the contents of the text. In 1619, the Dominican chronicler Antonio Remesal gives an account of the peaceful conquest of Tesulutlan by Las Casas and his group of friars that I mentioned before. Tesulutlan, in today's Kekchi-speaking region of Guatemala, had resisted the Spanish invasion uh, well into the 1530s. And Las Casas, when he heard that um, there was another attempt to conquer this region military, by, by military force, um, he requested and received permission from the crown to conquer this, reason, this region by mission rather than by sword, and thereby end the terrible bloodshed um, that had occurred in Highland Guatemala. For this purpose, Las Casas Las Casas recruited a team of polyglot and linguistically versatile Dominicans who dedicated themselves at writing doctrinal texts for the mission in the indigenous languages of the region. And the text in uh, Remesal reads as follows. The friars were the father friar Bartolomé de Las Casas, friar Rodrigo de Ladrada, and friar Pedro de Angolo, and friar Luis Canza. All of them knew the language of the province of Guatemala, which includes all of Quiche and Sacualpa very well. And among them, they wrote some strophes or verses in a manner permitted by the language with their consonants and rhythms. And in these, they described the creation of the world, the fall of man, his banishment from paradise. They included all the life and miracles of Christ our Lord, his passion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and when his second time will come again to judge mankind, and the end of his coming, which is the punishment of those who are evil and reward for those who are good. This work was a very long work, and as such, they divided it by pauses and different verses in the style of the Spanish ones, which, as these were the first to be made in the language of the Indians, deserve not to be forgotten for the many more that were written later. To summarize what uh, Remesal says, um, these writings were the first translation of the Christian doctrine into the language of Guatemala by Dominicans. It was a very comprehensive and long work in form of songs that were divided in strophes or stanzas. And, and this is the most significant, uh, the contents correspond one on one, including the order, with the contents of the text in the Kislak manuscript. So what, what does Remesal tell us about what happened with these songs and these stanzas? They were written, what happened with them? He, he goes on and he writes that uh, Las Casas found four indigenous merchants who traveled to Tesulutlan on a regular basis and were known to the local lord. And 
Remesal writes that with great care, the friars taught these four merchants who had already converted to Christianity how to sing these coplas or verses. Las Casas then sent the merchants to Tesulutlan to sing the songs of Christianity to the people and their cacique or lord. And Remesal writes, um, the merchants sang and preached and all the people came to hear the coplas. Almost for eight days they were singing about the creation of the world, about the fall of man, about the incarnation of Christ, about the resurrection of Lazarus. The merchants tried to sing a lot. The songs and the music excited the population uh, of Tesulutlan and the local lord, and they asked the merchants to explain the contents of the songs. These then asked the lord to invite the friars to explain them to to explain to them the contents of the faith. The first friar who went uh, to do this was uh, mentioned Friar Luis Cancer, who went to Tesulutlan and sang and preached. And then as a result, the Lord converted to Christianity and he signed a peace treaty with the Spanish crown. The province did not have to pay any tribute or tax for several years for accepting the king of Spain. So that is basically the story of the peaceful conquest as told by Remesal. Now you already guessing it, is that Gary and I assume that the text in the Kislak manuscript is a copy of these very coplas that are mentioned by Remesal, um, which is exciting on its own, but it's getting more complicated. Um, because there's another manuscript that um, has been identified as the very text referred to in Remesal. And this is um, this one here from the uh, Newbury Library in Chicago, which uh, Bossu suggested um, to be um, this very, very um, Coplas um, uh, manuscript um, that was written in Kekchi, the language of the region that was um, missionized by Las Casas and Cancer, and contains those songs that were mentioned in Remesal. So at first we thought there's a, um, there's a, there's a problem here, but when we looked at this uh, in more detail, we found that Bossu is right, because we found that the Kekchi couplers that Bossu wrote about and the text in the Kislak manuscript are two versions of the same text, one in Kekchi and the other one in Kiche. And if we compare these two texts, we can see that the Kekchi text is a bit more concise and a bit more abstract, but in terms of contents, both texts are identical. Comparing it um, in more detail, we, we see that the Kislak text is um, far more comprehensive and includes chapters and hymns that are missing in the manuscript from Chicago. And in addition, um, the individual chapters in the Kislak manuscript uh, include more stanzas and are much more detailed in the Kiché manuscript than in the Kekchi manuscript. So this suggests the following. We believe that we have rediscovered the very coplas that were mentioned in Remesal in their original language, and we think it is Kiché. And um, thereby, we may have identified the earliest doctrinal text from Highland Guatemala that may originally go back as far as into the 1530s when Las Casas began his mission in the Vera Paz. So this document is in the Library of Congress. It's a treasure here. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I know it was acquired uh, by Arthur Dunkelman on behalf of uh, Jay Kislak for uh, the Kislak collection, um, where it originally was, where Arthur Dunkelman acquired it, and uh, under which conditions, I don't know.
Yeah, there is. Um, the, the, the missionaries were really um, taking a lot of care in, um, in thinking about which terminology to use. And when we compare the doctrinal literature that we have from Highland Guatemala, we see that it's not standardized at all. It's very eclectic. Um, um, missionaries from different orders use different translation techniques and different strategies. And what we can see is that um, there are particular differences between Franciscans and Dominicans. Um, Franciscans um, prefer to use neologisms. Uh, so the, the prime example for this is that they uh, refuse to use, reuse any kind of indigenous term for, uh, for labeling God. They would introduce the Spanish term Dios and maybe change that to the, uh, to the, to the Mayan um, sound system a little bit so that it sounds like Tios, yeah? But they would not introduce um, any um, indigenous terminology, which is something that the Dominicans uh, did. And they did that very deliberately. And we can see that also in documents from other uh, Dominican um, or areas in which the Dominicans uh, had a lot of missionary activity, like in, um, in Quechua documents from the Andes. Um, Alan Dursen has written about this quite in quite detailed way. And uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have very different approaches uh, here. The, the Dominicans, th this is what makes the Dominican material so interesting, and this is what makes Highland Guatemala a very interesting place for researching the mission and the production or the creation of, um, of Christian terminology and Christian concepts in Mayan languages. Because we have uh, these two regions, we have the Quiche speaking region and we have the Cactuquel speaking region, two languages which are, which are very similar. Um, but the Cactuquel region was mostly dominated by Franciscan missionaries and the Quiche region by Dominicans. And they have very different approaches to translation. And you see in the Dominican material all this reuse of uh, terminology. And, uh, and Gary has written quite uh, extensively about the reuse of couplets and parallelisms. So Domingo de Vico is someone who um, has um, adopted uh, the, the ritual language uh, that was used in Highland Guatemala and is used to the present day. Um, Mayan um, uh, ceremonial specialists use a specific form of ceremonial discourse which has uh, a, a lot of parallelisms and couplet structure. And this very couplet structure you find in these uh, Dominican documents. And as I have to reference this to, to Gary, I mean, this is his work. <laughs> Just that's clear. <laughs> believe so. I think, I don't know whether this is, I must honestly say, I must blank on this. I, I don't know whether this was a strategy that missionaries had uh, uh, tried in other parts of the world before, uh, but it was certainly very successful and, um, um, and had a good effect because Remesal uh, writes in, in much detail, I've, I mean, I've given you a very uh, short account of, of this very detailed and colorful description that he has about how the, um, how, how the people really love these songs and love this music and the harmonies and, um, and wanted to learn how to, how to sing this. And they loved the outfit of the Dominican friars with their shaved heads and their black and white uh, gowns, which, which were interesting. It was just exotic. It was something interesting. Um, and that probably did help the mission. If you if you are confronted with something that you that you find exciting, you're probably also interested in learning more about it. So I think it was a very successful strategy, wherever it came from. Um, I I don't know whether it has been applied before.
I think this text was solely compiled for the missionary himself. Um, we have originally called him the Highland Maya priest, but we don't do this anymore because we don't really know whether it was really used by a priest or by a missionary of some other order. <coughs> but um, it was certainly something that somebody, I mean, because we have several texts that are eclectic different texts that were copied by the same hand. So there was somebody in a convent who probably sat down and either copied this for himself or had it copied for someone uh, to, be, to be used in the field, to be used on, on his mission. Um, he probably carried this book with him. And these songs were likely these songs, these original songs that were drafted. And they had been sung. They had been sung all over the highlands. They, they were part of the general, oh, I'm sorry, for the general, of the general um, law that was produced in order to um, missionize and, and, and um, preach the gospel. And every missionary who came into Highland Guatemala probably wanted to know these songs and thereby wanted a copy of it. So this copy was probably primarily for the missionary so that he would have this in writing since also all the missionaries who came from Spain, they had to learn the languages. They came, they, they knew Spanish, and they obviously knew Latin and, and maybe Greek, but, um, but they, they did not know the Highland Mayan languages. So they came and they first learned the languages and these handbooks with all this material helped them to, um, to, to, to learn and to memorize these songs and sing them to, to the people who, who could then repeat them. Yeah, the, um, the region of Tusulutlan was really fierce. The people there really resisted the conquest and um, the Spanish uh, undertook several attempts to, um, to defeat this region and always um, and never succeeded. But the, the conquest in the rest of the highlands has been, had been so bloody that there was, in particular from Cap uh, Bartolomé de las Casas and other missionaries, a lot of resistance to to this, and um, I think the 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 choice to to use merchants um, was a pragmatic one, because these were the only people who could get in there. The I guess that the people in Tesulutlan were so defensive, the only people who they would let in were probably uh, the merchants who came from other provinces and knew the languages and uh, brought in products from from other Highland Maya areas that were not necessarily controlled by the Spanish. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.